us at. Sounds good. We're live. Okay. Yeah. Just give me one second. And we are live. Hold on. Okay, guys. Hello, hello, hello. I'm just waiting for this to go. Okay, guys. So, guys, hello to everyone in the chat room. Hi, all. Tonight we have Mr. Jordan Maxwell back. Um, he gave us a little uh, a little exciting um, news. He wants to talk about the reptilian presence and he wants to talk about the extraterrestrial presence. All right, so those of you who don't know Mr. Maxwell, Mr. Maxwell is one of the forerunners in the truther community, the research community, alternative truth, how this world runs, the occult, the hidden the hidden governments, all these things, okay? Um, if you want to know more about who he is, his website is www.jordanmaxwellshow.com and you can join his research society where you can get 60 years of truth for $30. And those of you who want to support Jordan Maxwell, I'll take his, um, his PayPal, it's on his website, you can donate to Jordan Maxwell there. All right, Mr. Maxwell. So tonight, thank you for being on the show. My first question to you is, how are you? Well, uh, that's a hard and difficult question. Okay. Because I don't know how I am. Nobody ever tells me anything. I think I'm doing okay. But at 80 years old, I don't feel that good. Oh, but man. I'm still here. I'm still doing what I do. Okay. All right. Well, you're so, still here and we appreciate that you're still here. Yeah. Uh, just to give you a heads up, I got in contact with um, um, uh, the people connected to Credo Mutua. He's 99 years old. Oh, um, really? Yeah, he's 99. He's 99. Yeah. Well, I'm and, complaining because uh, I'm 80. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's 99. So they're like, you know, so I'll just keep you posted on that. But guys, Mr. Maxwell, so tell us something. Who are these reptilians? Well, you know, we are told in the Bible that it was a serpent who talked with Eve. If you remember that story, Adam and Eve and the serpent, serpents are reptiles. So it very well might be that that's what the Bible is talking about. There was a reptilian in the Garden of Eden. And that reptilian contacted the, the humans, Adam and Eve, and, uh, and caused problems for them. But it's interesting that the reptilian said that God was not being honest with them and that you would not die and so I have come to discover that there is a certain amount of legitimacy in that because the serpent, I think, was telling them the truth because they didn't die. Uh, you know, many, many hundreds of years later, they died like anybody else. But I think that this idea of the reptilians or the reptile aliens, yeah, there is a modicum of truth in it. I do believe there is something to that. And the reason why is because I've been all over the world and I've heard so many people tell me about their personal experiences with reptilians. And, and all of these people I have met around the world telling me the same thing, I have to assume that they must be telling me something true because everybody's saying the same thing. And I had a very wealthy man in Las Vegas. Many years ago, I used to do a late night talk show in Las Vegas. And I had a man call me after the show. He called me at the station and he said, Jordan, you were talking about reptilians. And he said, I have a story to tell you. And he said, uh, and he told me who he was. And that he was a multimillionaire that buys and sells hotels and casinos. This is a very wealthy man. 
and he said he said once a year uh, I go on vacation and the and the six guys that work with me work for me in my office they go on the vacation with me all six families they take their family I take my family we all go on a vacation somewhere once once a year and he this was this was back in 1990 back in 1990 or 91 and he said but this was back in 1990, and he said, last year, we all went on vacation to Colorado Springs, and we were all there, all seven families, all six or seven families were there on vacation. And he said, we were up in the mountain driving along, and we pulled off at a, at a scenic point, <clears throat> for the scenic point, and he said, we were, we were overlooking the valley, and it was called the Valley of the Gods. And he said, in the Valley of the Gods, we looked down and we saw a small circle that had been cut in the earth, small circle. There were no trees or bushes. And we saw a group of people in a circle holding hands and dancing back and forth and chanting some kind of a chant. And he said, we're up here on the highway <clears throat> watching them <coughs> excuse me <coughs> and they are in a circle holding hands doing a chant and he said while we were standing there watching them all of a sudden in the middle of the circle appeared a larger person there was one man in the middle leading the champ and he said, while we were standing there, all of a sudden, another person popped up out of nowhere. But it was much bigger, much bigger person. And he said, we could tell when that thing popped up in the circle, he pointed up at us to tell everybody, look who's seeing you. And he said, everybody stopped their singing. They stopped, and everybody was pointing at us. <clears throat> and he said, we knew we were in trouble. We need to get out of here because they see us now. And he said, when we jumped, turned around to get in the car, there was a reptile alien standing behind us. Just that quick from the valley to behind us, instantly he was there. And he said, when we turned around, we saw this reptile alien. He was about seven foot tall. It was very muscular, extremely muscular, but it was a reptile's face. And a reptile's scaly scales. And he said, and it, we were frightened to death. The women and the children couldn't say a thing. The women and children didn't cry. <clears throat> they didn't say anything. They were so frightened they couldn't even think to cry. And he said, and the men, all seven of us, was so frightened. We'd never seen anything like this, and especially that quick, from the valley to behind us instantly. And he said, and this thing stood there looking at, at us. He's telling me this on the phone. And he said, this reptile alien stood there looking at all of us, looking at the women and the children and the men. And he said he, he looked at us, and then he gave us a look like, I'm going to let you go this time. But when I let you go, you better get out of here and get out of here quick because you've interrupted me. So I'm going to let you go, but you've interrupted me, so you better get out of here quick. And he said when he looked at us, we got that message. We all realized the message. And he said when, and when he said that, <clears throat> boom, he was gone. He just was gone. And he said, when he disappeared, the women and the children went ballistic. They were screaming and crying and yelling. And we got all these women that are just blown away and, and frightened. And the children are uncontrollable, crying and yelling. And the men were frightened to start with. Now you got to deal with the women who are frightened, right? And he said, so when you talk about the reptile aliens, we know there is at least one in Colorado Springs because we don't seen him. He was behind us. So just remember, they are here. 
We know because we saw them. Six families saw them all at one time. And so I have been told so many times in my travels around the world, speaking on my subjects, I end up talking to other people and their subjects, professional people, aviators, scientists, astronauts, all kinds of interesting people. And, and I always bring up this reptilian thing and see what they have to say. One with reptile aliens. I myself have never seen a reptile alien, but I've had too many important people around the world tell me about their experiences. So logic alone tells me that if you got all these people around the world telling you basically the same thing, it makes sense that there's something there. I don't know what it is, but there is something to it. And happily, I don't want to see aliens. I don't want to see any reptile alien. But oh, another interesting point is that the old rabbis centuries ago, many centuries ago, and the rabbinical writings of the old rabbis is called the, uh, what is it called? There's a book that has all the collected comments of rabbis for the last thousand years. And if you go back to like 500 to 1,000 years ago, the rabbis that were talking about the Old Testament, what they had to say about the Old Testament, they said, and I will have to send you the link so you can read it yourself. The old rabbis, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, they said that Adam and Eve were reptile skin and reptile faces, and they were, had reptile skin. And that was, uh, it looked just like a reptilian. And I'm thinking, wow, that's hundreds of years ago. The Jewish rabbis were talking about Adam and Eve had reptile skin. And, uh, and then the Bible says that Eve talked with the, uh, a serpent, which is a reptile. And then when you start looking into people like Credo Mutwa, uh, from who are uh, mystery teachers and, and spiritual teachers in Africa and listen to these people who are well informed about the African understanding of the ancient and prehistoric world and the spiritual understanding of what's going on on the earth. And they're talking about reptile aliens. It becomes apparent to me that uh, there is such a thing as reptile aliens. There's no doubt in my mind about it because too many people have had one-on-one -on -one experiences. And then I told you, I think I mentioned this the last time, that Prince Charles, because we're told by David Icke and others like that, David Icke talks about how the royal family are a bunch of reptiles. Uh, I was telling, I told David Icke about reptilians back in the early 1992, 93. I told David Icke because I brought David Icke to America. And when he came here, I told him about the reptile aliens. And there was a good friend of mine who lives here in the States who was an expert on the reptile aliens. And uh, and I'll give you his I'll give you his website and you go and listen to him. He's got all the pictures and documents on reptile aliens. But the person I'm thinking about was telling me that the reptile aliens uh, he has pictures of them, and I was going to say that Prince Charles was on 60 Minutes. Quite a few years ago, Prince Charles was in, interviewed on 60 Minutes on television. And the, and, the, uh, and the interviewer, the interviewer guy for 60 Minutes, asked Prince Charles something that he didn't want to be asked. He didn't like it, that he was asked a certain question. And instead of being unkind or, or being, you know, uh, uncouth and and showing he didn't like the question, he didn't like talking about the subject, Prince Charles actually began to hiss like a snake. And it was on television, and I have a copy of it. I, I copied that. It was an incredible experience watching Prince Charles hissing 
like a snake. He didn't say anything. He just hissed. And if you go on the web today to YouTube and type in people hissing on television, and you will see different people, different movie stars, different newsmen, different people. Somebody has caught them and put it on the web. Go to YouTube and type in hissing people, people hissing. And you will see that people are being interviewed by someone and the person says something and the interviewer will hiss like a snake. Not arguing, just hissing. That's pretty incredible. When you see many, many times, they show you five or six people around the world hissing like a snake, and they all do it the same way. It leads me to believe that there is such a thing as reptile aliens on the earth. Of that, I'm pretty sure, because I've heard way too many stories and seen too much not to know there's something to that. Sorry about that. Sorry about really? that. So okay. My question is, where did they come from? Are they originally from planet Earth? Are they from another solar system? And are they all the same? Where did they come from? I have talked with scientists and people who are high up in the world of science and NASA, and they have told me they know where they come from. They come from a star system called Beta Reticuli. Beta Reticuli, I am told by scientists and astronomers and people who know, they said that the reptile aliens come from a star system, like a constellation called Beta Reticuli, which gives us re re reptiles from reticuli. And Beta Reticuli is supposedly where the reptile aliens have come from. So... I don't know. That's what I've been told by the experts. And it's really and an incredible story. And also, is there only one kind of uh, reptile? Or do they have like, you see how you have like the queen and governments and kings. Do they have like ranks and files and high um, Well, the Bible says in Genesis one twenty eight, the gods, the extraterrestrial gods, Elohim. The God said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so many Christians will say, there it is, right there in Genesis 1.28, God created man. No, it doesn't say God created man. Well, the top rabbis in America I used to talk to for years ago, and he told me there is no place in the Old Testament, no place, does it say God created man? It didn't say God created man. It says God came, the gods came and said, come, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. That's the reason for the sentence. Not come, let us make man. No, come, let us make man to look like us, to be like us. So therefore, if the scripture says, come let us, who's us? Somebody, a group from out there, a reptilians or whoever they were, they said, come let us make man look like us and be like us. So what I'm saying is that when I hear people who say that they have been abducted and they have seen extraterrestrials, but those extraterrestrials look like normal men. They look like humans. I'm saying, well, that's what the scripture said. The extraterrestrials who came here, they saw the indigenous creatures that we call the Neanderthal creature, the Neanderthal man. And they said, come, let us make him to look like us, to be like us. Let us make him look like us and be in our image and in our likeness. So that means that we humans today look like 
the extraterrestrials who came here from another world and messed with our DNA and caused us to be who we are today instead of being a, a Neanderthal creature like Bigfoot we are now looking like we look today and so there's a very big story here about come let us make man in our image after our likeness and so I don't know who they were. If they were reptilians, that means that we're made to look like the reptilians. But I have been told by people in government that reptilians have the uh, ability to, uh, what, what do we call it? The, to um, There's a word for it. Clone. When they, when they can change their shape. Their, oh, their shape shift. Shape, shape shifters. shifters. Shape shifters. And Steven Spielberg has shown that in his movies that the reptilians can instantly change their shape. When you see them, they can look like your mother. They can look like your father. They can appear just like your brother to you. And you think you're talking to your mother who has passed away or your, or your son or your uncle or whoever it is that you recognize them and you recognize them with all the details that's really them. No, it's not really them. It's reptile aliens who are shape shifters. They can shift their shape and look like what you want them to look like. They want to look like they want to make you think it's your mother. So you'll be honest with them. They'll look like your mother. And now you're talking to you when you say, I saw my mother last night in a dream and I talked with her. No, it wasn't your mother. It was something that was very, very smart and very clever. And it made, it made itself look like who you thought it was. It wasn't that person. It wasn't your mother. It was a shape-shifting reptilian who looks like your mother, who made himself look like for the moment. And so... I think that these reptile aliens can shape shift and make themselves look like anybody they want to, which means, here's the bottom line, here's what it means. It means that we could be on the earth right now with reptile aliens who look like presidents. They look like governors. They look like politicians that are leading the world. They look like important people in the world who are leading the governments of the world, and you think that these are just important men who are leading in positions of authority? No, they're not men. They've come here from somewhere else. They're shape-shifting reptile aliens, and they made you originally to look like them and to be like them. And so if they are like you, no, you are like them. And therefore, you are following a shape-shifting reptile, thinking that he's the governor, thinking that he's the president or the head of the big country. No, he has deceived you. Well, we talk about in the Bible about how the Satan, the devil, is in a position to deceive the whole world. Well, that's what I think is going on. The whole entire world has been deceived by a group of extraterrestrial aliens we call reptile aliens. And when you see people like Prince Charles and others, go on the web and look for it yourself. Go to YouTube and type in hissing people and watch the different people, especially important people, being asked a question or something, and they turn around and begin hissing like a snake. You've got to wonder about that. How come humans are hissing like a snake? I think I know. <laughs> so here's another question. Is there a reason why they're here? Do they have an agenda? I think it's just my opinion, but I've talked with astronauts. I've talked with scientists at NASA. I've talked with government, governmental agents. I've talked with high military people over the years. I've talked with so many people and gotten so many ideas from so many people. My gut feeling in answer to your question is just my opinion. I think that probably there was a movie made many years ago that was telling the real story. It was called 
um, it was about a group of aliens that came to this planet because their planet was being destroyed. I can't remember what the name of the of the movie was, but but the Alien. I what was it? Alien? No, no. Does anyone in the chat know that movie? No, no. It was it was back in the fifties, the early fifties. V. Is it V? No. But V is a good but V is very good. That's a very important movie. It's a very important show, V. But and it shows the reptile aliens coming to this earth. That was on that was on NBC television. But in order but in answer to your question, your original question, I think what's happening is that these individual reptile aliens who came here from Beta Particula Beta Reticuli. I think there's something going on on their planet where they live, and their and their planet is being destroyed somehow or another. It's being destroyed by by some kind of a natural catastrophe, some kind of a profound poison that's killing the people on the planet, and they are smart enough to know they got to get off that planet quickly because people are dying and ultimately anybody on that planet is going to die and be gone so they are they have to leave the planet and go out and try and find another planet to live on the beta reticuli or reptilians are dying on their own planet but they know also they're smart enough to know how to find us. We didn't find them. They can find us. And that shows you how intelligent they are in their technology. They're able to tell in the whole universe where people are and where's the best place to be and where to go and how to get there. So they have come here because they are dying on their own planet and they want to take over this planet because it's not only a beautiful planet, it's got plenty of water, it's got plenty of food. So they want to take over this planet, but they can't do it because we're, there's all so many of us. Well, they have made us to look like them so that they can now blend in with us. They can move in with us. And the women will think that the men are very handsome. The, the men will think the women are very beautiful. No, they're not men and women the reptile aliens who make themselves look like you so they can move in on you and you'll never know the difference okay so we have a question essential asked is there anything we can ever do to get rid of them i don't think so and the reason why is because they're obviously far superior to us it's like the ants getting together and talking uh, together. Is there any way we can get rid of that guy who lives in the big house? Because he's always out here with a with a lawnmower and he destroys our ant hill. Is there any way we can get rid of him? No, there is no way you're going to get rid of him. He might get rid of you, but you don't get rid of him. And so that's why I think the answer is no. There is no way for us to get rid of, and that's why the U.S. military and the big military operations around the world from China and Russia that know about these reptile aliens, they're not trying to get rid of them. What they're trying to do is make peace with them, make a deal with them, because if they're far smarter than you are and far bigger and far more powerful, it would make sense for you to make a deal with them create peace with them become their friend don't show them to be an enemy don't show them that you're an enemy because they deal with enemies and they can deal with you real quick and so the whole human race decided to be an enemy of the reptile aliens i don't think so they're far smarter than we are they got technology we don't understand that's why the movie television shows like v was telling you the visitors are here Okay, was the movie War of the Worlds? War of the Worlds? No, not War of the Worlds, but uh, that was the a day. very important one, though. What about The Day the Earth Stood Still? No, those were wonderful movies, but that wasn't it either. Okay, here's, um, my here's, here's a question. Black people don't have Neanderthal DNA, okay? Neanderthal DNA is found in European people. 
who did the reptiles create? That's the question. Because blacks don't have Neanderthal DNA. Who specifically did these reptiles create? Yeah, I know. I I understand what you're saying. I've thought about that myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I used to do interviews with the Nation of Islam with mm -hmm. um, Louis Farrakhan. I've done interviews in New Jersey with the with the uh, Nation of Islam, and they've asked me the same basic questions. And I have to think that probably there is something different between the black race and what we call the, the white race. And because from what we can tell scientifically, the black race was already here a long time before the white race, long time. So maybe the black race, as we call them, the black people, are the indigenous people on the earth, period. And that we are, the white people, are the newcomers. And, and I'll look at what we, the white people, have done on the earth as opposed to what the black population has done on the earth. And it's a very big question that needs to be looked at. And I, I've heard a lot of people talking about it. I don't know for sure what's going on because I'm not privy to know. I've asked the right people, but they're very cagey. They don't want to tell me everything, and I can tell it. They don't want to tell me the whole story. And the reason why they don't want to tell me is because, like George Carlin said, it's a big club, the guys who run this world. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. So we're not going to tell you anything you're not supposed to know. But I know there's something going on on the earth, and I got a feeling something's going to happen very soon on the earth. And we're going to find out what we want to know for tens of thousands of years. Something's happening right now on the earth. The whole world is up in arms now. The whole world is now asking questions. And I've talked with all the experts and I've got a lot of ideas. And I've come across some really interesting and important stuff dealing with ancient Egypt and the curses of the pharaohs in relation to the wars going on in the world today. And I've got that on my research society. So if you go on my website, the Jordan Maxwell Show, very important you put the word show, Jordan Maxwell Show, Dot com is my website. And when you go on the Jordan Maxwell show, you will see a link to a Jordan Maxwell Research Society. Click on that Research Society. It will take you to my other website. My other website is the Jordan Maxwell Research Society, and, and this is where I am uploading all of my documents and pictures and videos and all kinds of research material on all the subjects that we talk about. It's all there on my research society. So if you're interested to see the stuff that's really important and going on on my website, go to Jordan Maxwell's show and join my research society. It's only a one-time contribution for a lifetime subscription. Here's another question. Now, I think Jordan kind of answered this question, but I'm not gonna attempt to speak for him. I'm, I'm being asked, are these reptilians also in the African government? I mentioned earlier that they can take the four in positions of the question is, are they all, are they in the African government? I said that they were called shapeshifters and therefore they can look like anybody they wish. And so, obviously, if they can shapeshift into people who look like British royalty, they can also look like black royalty from, from Africa. Yes, they are obviously a, a capable, capable of making themselves look like, identical look like, anybody they want to. So, yes, in answer to your question, I think that, yes, Africa probably has reptile aliens at the at the head of government too, just like all the rest of the world. Okay, so here's another question. 
How can you neutralize their power? What is their weak spot? And how can that be exploited? That's a very good question. And to that, I have no answer. I don't know. I do know that there are military people very high up in world government who know what I'm talking about, who I've talked to, and I know that they are aware of what I'm talking about. But they've never told me what they're doing about it because I've asked them, what are you going to do about this presence of these reptile aliens? If they're really here, what are you going to do about that? Nobody ever said a word. And the reason why I think is because they know they can't do anything about it. I think they know you better make friends with them and sue for peace. Present yourself as their friends. Because if you don't, if they if they believe if they if the reptile aliens think that you are their enemy, they'll deal with you and you don't want to know what that's like. Because they have technology you don't understand. They can time travel. They can travel through the universe. They can find you anywhere. Because they found us already. They know how to find life forms in the universe. And this is a big universe. It's not just our one galaxy. There's billions of galaxies. But the reptile aliens, they found us anyway. They came here anyway. No matter how small and minute we were. In the whole of creation, they found us, and they came here. So anybody has got that kind of intelligence and that kind of technology, you don't want to mess with them. Just be their friends, and maybe they'll leave you alone. <clears throat> okay, one more question before I let you continue. Um, so these reptilians, I have a question. Now, it appears to me that they have a hatred for all humanity, but it seems like they really hate black people. Do you see that? It appears to me that they hate, or could it be that when they got here, according to some black and African um, ancient historians, when they got here, they first tried to make um, a contract with black governments when blacks were across the planet and the blacks rejected them. They left and came back with a vengeance, and some somewhere in between, the, that's when the white race showed up. What is your take on that? Yeah, I think that there might be something to that, that there is some kind of an animosity going on because all the motion pictures and movies and TV shows and all the documentaries always come up with the same idea that these reptile aliens all look like us, as they can look like us, and shapeshift, but they're not your friend. They're not your friend at all. They've come here to take us over. And the best way to do that, because there's so many of us humans, and we do have the ability to defend ourselves as humans. We do have atomic missiles and atomic stuff that is very dangerous and very threatening and the reptile aliens know that so i think that they want to come in and take us over but doing it in such a way that we agree to it because they look like us and we look like them and they are national leaders no they're not national leaders there was a i've said this before have you ever thought about how much money it would take to finance Steven Spielberg in one of his movies, like you know, like uh, uh, um, what is it, the the Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Spielberg's movie Close Encounters and E.T. Have you ever thought about how much money it costs to finance Steven Spielberg movie? which is an hour and a half movie, and millions and millions of dollars. Well, what you may not know is that many years ago, Steven Spielberg produced a television series called Taken, T-A-K-E-N, Taken. And from what I remember, it was 19 hours long. 19 hours of Steven Spielberg 
doing a, a producing a television series called Taken. And in the television show Taken, you can go on the web. I think you can actually watch it on the web today. If you go to YouTube and type in Taken, T-A-K-E-N. Taken was, was well, he got that name from a book by a, a lady doctor. Uh, I can't remember her name right now, but she wrote a book called Taken. And she was very, very incredibly interesting. Because she talked about how the reptile aliens are here, but they look like humans and how they will play with us and kidnap us and take us away. And we trust them because we think they're just important humans. They're not humans. And you're going to find out after they take you, where they're taking you're going to find out they're not human. And so she was very, very interesting and very interesting because she had a lot of good information. Nobody knows where she got it from. And her book called Take Him was a very thick book. Well, Steven Spielberg got a hold of that book and he made 19 hour television special about Taken. And I'm thinking to myself, do you know how many millions it takes to finance Spielberg with one 90-minute movie? He did 19 hours on that subject of people who have been kidnapped by reptile aliens. So while it may not sound very impressive to you, Spielberg thought it was really important. He spent 19 hours pre presenting the story about reptile aliens taking humans. And the name of the TV show, again, was simply Taken. So people like Spielberg think it's important to spend that kind of money and to tell that kind of a story. There must be something to it. I just want to say to those uh, donating in the chat room, thank you. And to Kitty Key, Kitty Key, you have to be a little bit um, more wise than that. They're not going to tell you on the stock exchange that they're selling you this goes back to maritime law, that they're buying and selling you a stock. So really think about that, okay? Um, let's see. All right. Uh, who is Dr. Carla Turner? Sorry, go ahead. Carla Turner was the one who wrote the book, Taken. That's uh, That was her name. She was a brilliant lady. I love listening to her. She was very, very insightful. She had a lot of information, and she must have really impressed Steven Spielberg because he made the 19-hour television show on her and on her book called Taken, where she talks about the reptile aliens who came here, and they can shape chef and make, and make themselves look like humans, and then you will follow them, and then they will take you. And that was the name of her book called Taken. Okay, so who's Carl Jansky or Carl Jansky? That's what I wanted to talk about. I the have world. the information. Yeah, I, that's what I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk about Carl Jansky. All right, let's roll. Okay. Many years ago, there was a book came out and it's still very popular today. It was supposedly written thousands of years ago. I don't know. I'm just telling you, it, it's, the book was supposed to have been written, I don't know, maybe four or 5,000 years ago. Today, you can still buy the book on, on, on the web, and the book is called The Theogony of Hesiod. Theogony of Hesiod. That's T-H-E-O-G-O-N-Y. The Theogony of Hesiod. Hesiod is H-E-S-I-O-D. That book was supposedly written many, many thousands of years ago before the Roman Empire existed. It was an ancient Greek book, a very thick book. And Hesiod was supposedly a herdsman. He was nothing more than just a regular herdsman that had had his flock in the end of sheep. And he said, uh, in, in his book he wrote, called The Theogony, that the word theogony means 
the story of the 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 is in greek is the gods so the agony was the story of the gods in the heavens and and um Hesiod was out, he said, in his book, he said he was out one night with his flock, watching over the flock of sheep, and three angels, he said, three angels come floating up to him. They didn't walk up. They floated up to him, and they confronted him, and he said they were glowing figures. They were glowing angels, and he said, and they told him, they spoke to him telepathically. And they told him, we are called muses, not angels, muses, from which we get the word amusement, museum, or music, music, museum. The muses were angels who came here from another world, and they confronted him at night uh, uh, when he's watching his flock. And they said the reason why they were coming to him is because they wanted him to write a book. And he told them, I can't write a book. I, I can't read or write. And they said, it doesn't matter. We'll do the writing for you. We just want you to do the book. And we'll lead you. And we want you to tell the world about the theogony in the heavens, the worship of all the gods. We want to explain to you humans what's going on out there. And it's going to be a big, thick book about all the gods and who they are and what they do and who's in charge of who and who does what. And it's going to be called the theogony. Well, the theogony was written and today the book is still possible. You can still get it. Uh, just look for it, the theogony of Hesiod. Well, the muses told him that they wanted to show and tell the world about the gods who control us in, in our universe, in the Milky Way universe, where we are in the Milky Way, and in our particular little area that we call our solar system, there is a god over us. There are different gods in our Milky Way galaxy over different peoples and over different sections. And the muses told Hesiod, that they were going to explain to him about all the gods in the universe, and especially the one who is over us in our area, over the earth. And they said that that um, he told them he couldn't read or write, and they said they were going to do it for him. They would show him how to do it. And so they said that the god who was over us, his name was Zeus. And so Zeus was the father of the human race. He was over us. And they even have a canal in the Middle East named after Zeus. It's called the Suez Canal. Suez is Zeus spelled backwards. So the Suez Canal was devoted to the worship of Zeus. And so the muses said that 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 Zeus lived on a floating city. And it was that floating city was, it was in uh, a, a constellation of stars called Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia is where Zeus, the god over the, over the earth, lives. He lives in Cassiopeia, which is a group of stars. And so, Cassiopeia. So they went on to tell Hesiod that Zeus... If Zeus were to go, they said, if Zeus were to go out on his porch with an anvil and he dropped the anvil off his porch, it would take so many days and so many nights and so many hours before it would hit the earth. Nine days and nine nights and so many hours and so many minutes before it would hit the earth. Well, that's easy to calculate today on a computer. We find out how long, how how fast something falls on the Earth, and calculate that out for nine days and nine nights and uh, nine uh, hours and whatever, and then you can tell just about how far out Zeus is, if that's true. And so it was determined by the U.S. Navy that that was about a little over three million miles from here. 
it would take nine days and nine nights for a, a, an anvil to fall here and hit the earth. A little over nine, a little over three million miles. Well, so now we now know when you pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Zeus. Zeus in Latin is Dios. Dios in English is God. So when you hear Christians and people talk about God, you're talking about Dios in Latin, which is God in Latin. Dios, look it up in the dictionary, comes from the word Zeus. Zeus is God over the earth according to the ancient understanding of the scriptures. So that today when you talk about God, you're talking about Zeus. And hallowed be thy name, yeah, well, hallowed be his name is Zeus. So, back in the 1930s, and this brings in the subject we were talking about. Back in the 1930s, there was an American astronomer named Carl Jansky. An American astronomer named Carl Jansky. K-A-R-L. J-A-N-S-K-Y. Carl Jansky was an astronomer in America. 1930s. Carl Jansky built the first radio telescope. He actually won an award for being the first man to invent a radio telescope. We now have them at Goldstone, Arizona. We now have big radio telescopes around the world. But he was the first one that came up with the idea for a radio telescope. Carl Jansky. And he was called the, the father of modern radio telescopes. He built also, with the radio telescopes, he also invented how to create a radio transmitter to the radio telescope so he could send out messages into space. And so Carl Jansky built a radio transmitter to beam signals into heaven. And in 1930, Carl Jansky just decided, after reading the, the book, of, uh, of uh, the agony of Hesiod that he would aim the telescope to the constellation of Cassiopeia and send out a message to Cassiopeia just to see if Zeus was home and what would happen. So he sent out the message to Cassiopeia, Carl Jansky, and he got back a message, a very intelligently brought back to him a message. But what made it interesting, more interesting, is that the message was amplified. He got it back crystal clear. Somebody was sending a, a, a message back, but he didn't understand the language. He didn't know what the message was. He couldn't understand the language. But it was very crystal clear. So somebody was in Cassiopeia sending back a message. That is important. That's impressive. Then after that, when uh, Carl Jensky passed away, there was another man who came into the picture and, and who was also an astronomer, and he was in Scotland. And his name was named Duncan Lunan, L-U-N-A-N. Duncan Lunan was an astronomer in Scotland, and he had read all about Carl Jansky and his radio telescope and sending out messages and getting messages back from Cassiopeia. So Duncan Lunan decided he was going to do the same thing. So he sent out a message to Cassiopeia and he got back a message. It was amplified, very crystal clear and intelligently sent back, but he didn't understand the language. He didn't know what it was saying which proved that there's somebody out there sending a message back. Why? Because you sent a message to him. So somebody's out there sending you back a message. Well, the agony of Hesiod said it's Zeus, and Zeus in Latin is Dios, Dios. And Dios in English is God. So when you say, Our Father who art in heaven, our Father is Zeus, and he's sending you back a message. Yes. But isn't it true that we have um, 
at least 20 Greek historians studying in Africa for over 200 years before the Greek civilization was created under the Ptolemies and later yes. on the Hellenists? Yes. Okay, yes, so it's true. Yeah. And the only, reason, the only reason I brought up of, uh, of uh, Carl Jansky is because you mentioned his name. Yes, it's true. As a matter of fact, there's a people in Africa today. Their, their, their word, the name of their tribe is the Dogons. The Dogons. Have you heard about the Dogons of Africa? It's an African tribe in Mali. I think it's in Mali, in the mountains. And they talk about the whole universe, and they give you exact measurements of the sun, the moon, how much the earth weighs, where the different planets are, and they tell you all about the universe that we don't know nothing about. And the, and the human race is now learning about the whole universe and things we've never heard before as humans, that the Dogon, they, are, they know all about it. And so we asked them, how do you know all of these things? Because now we're doing the research on what the Dogons are telling us, and they were right. They are very right on everything they're telling us. And we asked them, how do you know these things? Well, you're just an African tribe in Africa, and you don't have the, the equipment we do. And we, and we got all the top equipment. We don't even know what you're talking about. And the Dogon says, very simple. They come down here every now and then. They talk to us. They don't call you. They come talk to us. And they tell us all about your world and what's going on in the universe. And so that's how we know. So the Dogon people are very impressive. D-O-G-O-N, I think it is, Dogon. The Dogon people know all about life in the universe. And they say the reason why they know is because extraterrestrials have come down to them and talked to them personally and told them. Well, somebody told them, because the Dogons know things that we don't even begin to know. Somebody's here talking to them. So, like you said, maybe there are Africans who are being told things we didn't know on the earth until they told us. And how did they know? Because somebody came down and talked to them. They didn't come talk to us. And that's why I say, if I were an extraterrestrial, I wouldn't talk to us either. People ask me, if, 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 the, if the extraterrestrials are here, I get people asking me, if there are extraterrestrials here, and they look like us, they can communicate with us, why don't they come and show themselves to us and show who they are and talk to us? And I said, I'm like you. I'm human like you are, and I don't want to talk to you. You're so profoundly stupid. I don't even want to talk to you. I'm ashamed to be in your company. So why would they want to come here from another world far, far more in our future, knowing things that we don't even begin to know, and they come down here, why would they want to talk to you? Why would they want to talk to me? When was the last time you got on your knees on the sidewalk and talked to an anthill and tried to explain to them Einstein's work? When was the last time you tried to explain to a bunch of cockroaches under a brick, under a rock, and you're trying to explain to them what Einstein was teaching? When was the last time you tried to communicate with creatures that were beneath you? That's why the extraterrestrials who come here, they don't try and help educate you. Because, you know, as far as they're concerned, you're just a waste of time trying to talk to you. Trying to talk to any human is just a waste of time because humans don't have the brains enough to understand. I understand that thinking. Anyway, Carl Jansky's radio transmitter sent out messages to Cassiopeia and got back messages. Then Duncan Lunan, D-U-N-C-A-N, and Lunan is L-U-N-A-N. Duncan Lunan was a Scottish astronomer, and he sent messages out to Cassiopeia, and he got messages back. And the star that he aimed that transmitter at, Duncan Lunan, the star he aimed it at, today you could go on the web and look it up on the web or look it up in encyclopedia. It's called the Lunan Object. It's on the web called Lunan Object. The Lunan Object is a particular star 
in the constellation of Cassiopeia, where Duncan Lunan aimed his transmitter and sent out a message, and he got one back. So it became known as Lunan's object. But the scientists don't talk about Lunan object today. They don't tell you about cancer. And they've had a cure for cancer a thousand years ago. But they're not telling you because cancer makes a lot of money for the government and for the medical medical facilities of the world are making billions of dollars off of the poor people who contribute to cancer. Cancer research. Cancer research is a fraud. They've known what cancer is for a thousand years. They know how what to do with cancer and how to, how to control it. They know what cancer is. They don't need to research it. That's for the poor, ignorant people to give their money to cancer research, to find out how to stop this terrible thing of cancer. They know how to stop it. They, what they're doing is they're ripping you off with money, taking your money and supposedly doing research for cancer. The same thing with the Lunan object. The government's not telling you anything about the Lunan object. Why? Because if you aim a transmitter at that Lunan object, that little star in the Cassiopeia, and you send out a message, you'll get one back. So I, when I hear that government is looking for life in the universe, they're looking at sending out all these different uh, messages into the universe to see if there's life out there, you know damn well there's life out there. Aim it at, at the Lunan object, fool and see what comes back, and then tell me you're looking for life. It's already out there, and we've already contacted a long time ago, before your mama was born. We already know who they are and where they've come from. We know about the reptilians, the reptile aliens. We know about the extraterrestrials, the Elohim. We know about the Lunan object. There's a lot of stuff we now finally know. Yes. So... Do you think the reptilian aliens is Yahweh? Say that again. Do you think he's a reptile? Do I think the reptiles what? No, do I think Yahweh? Yahweh was a reptile? Yes. Oh, that makes yeah. sense to me. Yeah, that sounds like it. Because I am a personal friend with Dr. Joseph uh, Farrell, Dr. Joseph Farrell, and I talk on occasions. And he's done a lot of research on that. And Yahweh, the God of the Jews, was obviously some kind of an extraterrestrial who was very bloodthirsty and, and murderous. And that's why today, all over the world, you're having wars, killing people and murdering people. Why? Because of Yahweh. That's a whole story. Anyway, when you get back to Duncan Lunan, <clears throat> which is a real incredible story, no doubt. The Greek word for God, in Greek, the Greek word for God is Theo. T-H-E-O in Greek is God. That's why if you're going to study the subject of God, it's called theology. Why? Because T-H-E is God in Greek. And so, if I'm working for the President of the United States personally, directly for him, I'm in his employee, and we, you and I are talking, and one day I say, so where are you working? And you say, oh, I work for a guy, I work for a man over here doing this or that. I say to you, I'm working for the man. You're working for a man. No, I'm working for the man. The means the top of the line, the best there is. <clears throat> you have an old Ford car. I got a brand new Maserati. Therefore, I, you have an A car. I've got the car. So when you hear people say, well, he is the man, the means God and Greek are the highest. And so, <clears throat> uh, and, the, and I wanted to show you something too. <clears throat> There's a statue in the Vatican today, 
for St. Peter. I was there in the Vatican, I saw it as a saint, as a picture, as a statue of him sitting in a chair. And people come by and kiss his shoes and kiss his feet. Catholics from all over the world, people from all over the world come by and they have to kiss his feet. They've been kissing his feet for so long, he don't even have any feet anymore. It just, it just wore down to nothing. So he's got so many people kissing his feet in the Vatican because he is Moses. He is he is a great prophet of God. No, it's not Moses. It is Zeus. Zeus is a statue of Zeus. And look in the Catholic Encyclopedia, and it will tell you that the that the statue of Saint Peter in the Vatican is actually an old statue that was found in the ancient Greek world of the god Zeus and brought to the Vatican, and people think it's the statue of St. Peter. <clears throat> Why? Because in Latin, the word pater, P-A-T-E-R, pater is your father. That's where we get the word papa. Papa is your father. And so this is why the Pope is called the Holy Father. He's Papa. And he's the Holy Father because why? Because he talks to God. He's a Godfather. You get it? Italian. Godfather. That's the name of the two. Mafioso. Right. <laughs> so when you begin to see how the word pater was an old Babylonian word that goes back to a Phoenician Canaanite word called pitter, P-I-T-E-R, P-I-T-A-R, Pitter or patter. We've heard the word pitter, patter. No, pitter is God the Father, or patter in a different language is Father God. So pitter and patter. And therefore, the Jews, if you go back into this in, uh, the uh, encyclopedia, look up how to spell the word J-E-W, Jew, in the ancient English back uh, you know, hundreds of years ago. 900 years ago in English, how do you spell Jew? It was spelled I-U or I-O-U. That's the way it was spelled. And so if you spell Jew, I-U, right, or I-O-U, yeah, that's the way you spell it. Look it up in the dictionary. And then you see I-U, the I-U's were what we call the Jews. We call it J-E-W. No, it was spelled I-U. And so they were the worshipers of the Babylonian god, Pater, P-A-T-E-R. So the Catholic Church said, well, that's Peter, P-E-T-E-R. No, not Peter, Pater. Peter and Pater was God the Father in the ancient languages of the Middle East, not Peter. So therefore, Pater was God. And the Jews would call I-U, where I's and J's are interchangeable. You will see that in the encyclopedia. The, the letter J is an I with a little tail. It's an I with a little tail. So I's and J's are the same letter, and they're interchangeable. <clears throat> so therefore, <clears throat> you have the Jews, I-U, worshiping the God of the heavens, Pater, so he became known as I.U. Pater. But I's and J's are interchangeable. So it becomes Jupiter. So the planet Jupiter is I.U. Pater. The king god of all Jews is Jupiter. That's why we call him the, the head of all the gods is Jupiter. Because it goes back to the Jews who worship Pater. So it's Jupiter is their god, but not Saturn? Saturn is also a god. <clears throat> and today, Saturn becomes the most important god in the Jewish religion. <clears throat> you have to realize that there is no people on the earth who were worshippers of one god. There's never been a people on the earth who were worshippers of one god. If you go back into history and trace the history, you will see that different people worship different gods all the time. 
different gods and different people all the time are worshiping one god one time and then the next time you see them they worship a different god and now they got a different one now and next year they'll have another different one so nobody's ever worshiped one god <clears throat> like we talked about the last time we're told that the jews were the first monotheistic people monotheistic means the worship of one god and the Jews, were, we are told, were the first monotheistic people. Meaning that we have been told today in our universities and our schools that the Jews were the first worshipers of one God. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Jews were not worshipers of one God. If you go back to the word God, L, and look in the Bible in Genesis 1, 1, the word is not L, L is God. But the, the Bible says God is Elohim in the plural, the different gods, not one God, many gods. So the Jews were worshipers of many gods. But it's like you have 15 gods standing in front of you and they're all equal. And you pick out one of the gods and say, I like him in particular. I want him to be my God. And he agrees and says, okay, and I'll be your God and you'll be my people. And you will follow me and I'll be your God. That's why in the, in the Ten Commandments, God said to the Hebrews, I am the Lord your God. There are many other gods out there, but in the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord your God. And I will not have any other gods before me. I'm jealous. I'm a jealous God. The same thing in the male population. Men are getting married. They got a young girl they're getting married to. And they tell the girl, yes, there are many other good-looking men out there like me, maybe better than me. But you got to deal with me. You're going steady with me, and we're engaged. So you picked me, and I agreed to it, and I allowed and picked you. So we have an agreement here, I, and there are, other, there are other young men out there, but I don't want to catch you with them. I don't want to see you with any other young man. You made a deal with me. And so you say, well, he's jealous. Well, that's what the Bible says. God is a jealous God. Yeah, because he, you picked him out of a group. So if you picked him out of a group, we could say that you are a worshiper of one God. Yeah, the one you picked. But there are 14 others you didn't tell us about. And so when you understand that theology and religion has been completely and totally messed up and people have no idea in the world when they go to church what the word church means, where they get the word Jesus comes from, they talk about Jesus the Christ, they have no idea in the world what Christ means. They have no idea in the world what the word church means. And it's an incredible story about how much we don't know about religion today. We have all been fooled and deceived, and now it's beginning to look like all of these religious institutions are falling apart. Very happy to hear that. Here's a question, here's a question. So we know the reptilian presence is here, right? What about the Greys, the Nordics, the Andromedans, the blue avians what about other out well i would say i would say if there was one group out there that was so sufficiently intelligent and so highly evolved as to present uh abilities that we humans don't have we can't do what they do they can shape shift and look like other creatures we can't do that they can find us out there in the universe. We can't find them. We can't even find our way home half the time. So if there are other people out there in the universe that look like us, maybe there are other races out there in the universe who have also found us, and they've also come here. And so maybe that explains the Greys and the Nordics and all these others, the Nordics supposedly, are just big men, they're big men. No, they're not men. You, They look like men, but they're not men. So, so they're not men. They just look like men. 
because we look like them and we call ourselves men. So anyway, I think that's where we come from. All these different gods have come from. I think that the reason why they've come here is because they've come here from different places in the universe. They all found us and we haven't found them. And they are messing with us. They're calling themselves gods and angels and spirits. And so it begins to look like we've been played for fools. Do you think there's a fight going on between them? Because I'm picking up that there's a fight between the reptilians, the Nordics, the Andromedans, the blacks, the tall blacks, the whites. The, the I feel like the, insectoi <coughs> the insectoids or insectilians, I feel like there's a war going on here for this planet. Well, and if they... If they made us, like the Bible says, come let us make man in our image, after our likeness. That means we look like them and we're like them in their likeness. So we're always killing each other and fighting each other and bad-mouthing each other and calling each other names. Why? Because that's what they do. We're made in their image and likeness. We're like them. Are. We're like they are. They're crazy and calling each other names and fighting each other. Well, so are we, because we're made their image and their likeness. So I think there's probably something to that idea, that there are different kinds of life forms who have come here from other worlds, and they want to take over this, this, this planet. And there's like different gangs have moved into town, and you know that ain't going to work. There's only going to be one power in town, and the other gangs are going to have to go somewhere else. And so that's what's happening today. I think that the reptilians are now having to deal with other life forms who are coming here from other worlds. And they'll say, no, no, nobody invited you here. This is our place. This is our game. And so, yeah, there could very well be some kind of a warring going on between the extraterrestrials. For sure, because I'm detecting, like... It looks like there's a war between the reptilians and the insectoids, the Nordics. Yep. Like, you can see it. I feel like AI, artificial intelligence, comes from the insectoid because it's designed after an insect colony. You see what I'm saying? But chemtrails looks like it comes from the reptilians to kill the insectoids. But it's harming... You see what I'm saying? Because the chemtrails harm the insects the most. So I'm like, it looks like there's a war going on on this planet. That's what the movie, The Men in Black, remember The Men in Black, the movie? They're dealing with human uh, 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 insects. And it's true. Yeah, I think you're right that, the, that we are dealing with insectoids also. Extraterrestrials yeah. who look like our insects. Yeah, because, you know, when you look at, like, chemtrails, you ask yourself, like, what's the purpose of chemtrails? And then it hit me one day. The insectoids, chemtrails are like bug spray. <laughs> it's yeah. literally bug spray. And it's the first thing they kill. Like, when was the last time you saw a bee? Yeah. You know? So it, it like dawned on me, but then when you look at AI, AI is designed after an insect colony. You're right. So you look at these things and you're like, is there a war going on on this planet that we don't know about? That's true. AI does resemble an insect colony because it's AI as an artificial intelligence in which everything buys into. Well, the ants all are one ant. It's one colony. The, the, the birds are all thinking in one. And this is why when you see birds by the thousands of birds, all of a sudden, all the birds are flying one way, and then instantly they turn and go a different way. How come all the birds and the fish, fish also are in schools, how come all the fish are swimming one way, and instantly they turn and go a different way? How come they all turn at the same moment, as if they all knew to turn the same way? It's because some kind of an artificial intelligence is being put into them. We say they have instinctive. What do you, what do you talk about instinctive? Some you may want to look this up. Sorry, guys. You may yeah. want to look this up, guys. It's called Swarm AI. Swarm Artificial Intelligence from um, Harvard University. 
and they were using the collective of insects and bird, uh, sorry, and animals that swarm together to understand how they can use this on humans, swarm AI. So this is why when I read this, I said to myself, I said, could it be that artificial intelligence they got from the insectoid, the reptilians got jealous and started unleashing bug spray called chemtrails? Yeah. There's a war going on on this planet, guys. Open your eyes and you're going to see it. Oh, and you can you look at GMOs, GMOs. Like, genetically modified. Yeah, genetically modified. Somebody is at war with another culture and they're genetically trying to get rid of you. But doing it in such a way that nobody's going to jump on them, nobody's going to say anything. We're just going to get rid of you. Slowly but surely, you're not going to be here much longer. And so it's called GMO, Genetically Modified Foods for Genetically Modified Humans. And this, and I think you're right with this, with this uh, spring. It has something to do with life on the earth. I think you're right. There's something there. There's something there for sure. So what do you think is the long-term goal um what do you think is this long-term goal of these of these alien races fighting for control of this planet because it appears to me that let's 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 um veer left for a second so i was told by some um nazi super soldiers do you know the concept of super soldiers yeah Okay, so some Nazi super soldiers, they have a belief of how they're going to run the planet and they have their extraterrestrial faction that they work with. Then you have mm -hmm. the Zionists and they have their faction that they work with. So mm -hmm. the Nazi faction are with the Vril, who's a type of reptilian, right? And they believe in a perpetual war and they believe in an ubermensch and eugenics to get it done. So perpetual war upgrades technological upgrades and also like injections and trans transhumanism to upgrade and then eugenics to wipe out the weaker genes yeah. then you have another faction which is the zionist faction they're straight up draco reptilian which is what runs the planet now so i'm looking at this and i'm like okay where do you think is if we have the insectoids on this planet as well it appears to me that they're fighting with the reptilians Okay, then you have the Vril who are at war with the Dracos. Okay, then you have the Andromedans and you have the tall blacks, you have the big headed blacks, you have all these different alien species fighting over this planet. Where do you think this planet is heading uh, in the future with these alien races fighting over this one rock and why? There must be something about this earth that's very important and we don't even realize it. We don't know why. Because why is it that this earth is covered with life and water everywhere? We've got insects, we've got dinosaurs, we've got dogs and animals and people. We've got all kinds of fish and flying creatures. We have nothing but life going on everywhere. Wherever else we look in the universe, we just see a round, deserted planet. Nothing, no life and no water, no nothing. But we are crawling with life and water. So there's something strange about us. And why? Because somebody designed us to be here. There's no doubt in my mind. Somebody is watching us. They have put us here and are watching us. The Bible talks about the watchers, people, the spirit entities who are here to watch us. And they are watching over something that's been created, and that's us. And we have been created as a creature, and we are being invaded by other creatures now. It's a really interesting story, and it's an interesting question that you raise. And I do believe there's something to this story. Okay. Do you know about Admiral Bird and Antarctica? What do you think about what scared him when he got down there? Is it a Nazi base for a creature that's so hideous 
that they have to quarantine Antarctica and only presidents can go there. Well, you can think what you want, but the bottom line is he did go down there and he turned right around and came right back and he ain't been there since. And he ain't going back. <laughs> and so he must have seen something and experienced something down there that you don't want to know about. You don't want to know what he saw and what he experienced. And all those guys that went with him, they were all under orders to keep their mouth shut, period. Anything you see down there, you don't ever talk about to your family, to nobody. You're under orders in the military to keep your mouth shut. So, yes, there's no doubt in my mind, Admiral Berg had some kind of an experience with life down there in Antarctica that we have no idea in the world what he saw and what he had to deal with. But we do know he went down there with a major force from the U.S. went down there with many soldiers and ships and turned around and came right back and never went back. And that's it. But isn't it true that the Nazis, were down there and part of what helped them with their rocketry came from Antarctica? I think that there is a very definite connection between the Germans, the Jews, the God of the Jews, the God of the Germans, and the Nazi party. There's a very definite connection with Nazis and Jewish and Germans and Nazis. It's all part of something big and was just now beginning to find out that there's some connection going on with the God of the Jews, the God of the Germans, the Germanic people, and the Adolf Hitler and the Nazis and going down into south and going south into Antarctica. Something was going on down there, and it's now coming out. And now we've got people from all over the world, governments from all over the world, going down to Antarctica. Why? Because something is going on down there. Kind of reminds me of the movie The Thing. If you remember back in 1950s, the, the movie The Thing, it kind of reminds me of, of what's going on in Antarctica. Something is going on down there. And, all, and nobody is being invited, but only military and government people are going down there. And there's a lot of people like the Germans and the Russians and the Europeans that are down there because something's happening. They haven't told you what it is. And I don't think you want to know what it is. Because whatever it is, uh, you know, the Admiral Byrd found out what it was, and he came back immediately. And he lost a lot of men while he was down there. Something happened. And so I think that there is something going on down there that is not of this world. That's my feeling. Okay, so I have another question. Um, let's see. Do you know who Delbert Blair was? Delbert Blair? Yeah, I know that name. The black metaphysician? Diana yeah, I... <laughs> Yeah, I know that name well because I came across it many times, but I just don't recall who he was. He was a black metaphysician. Okay, so that answers that question. What about black extraterrestrials? Why do you think that all the high-level people in government and the military do not want black people to know that some of the most advanced extraterrestrials are black? And why do you think Norman Bergrun had to go into hiding because of this? Yeah. Norman, what was his last name now? Bergrun. Yeah, Norman Berglet. Yeah, Berglet. Uh, I was at a conference and speaking up in San Francisco a few years back. And this little man, this little scientist looking man, I saw him, and I thought to myself, he looks like a, a NASA scientist. He just looks like a scientist. He's just a little man with a little bow tie, but he looked like a scientist to me. And so he comes up to me while I was in the lobby of the hotel. He said, Jordan, I've come here to talk to you. Can we talk? And so we went outside and sat in the plaza, went outside and talked, and he said, you are always talking about the planet Saturn in relation to religion. I am a scientist who worked at NASA, and he gave me his card. 
And he said, I have in my briefcase some pictures I want you to see. Nobody else has seen. He opens up his briefcase, pulls out some pictures. And he's showing me where there are extraterrestrial vehicles going into the planet Saturn and coming out. Not landing on Saturn, going into Saturn and coming out of the planet. And he said, we at NASA know that there are some kind of life forms that are far, far superior to us, and they are on the planet and in the planet Saturn. And he went on to tell me later on, as we were talking about it, that they were black, extraterrestrial, and they were black, and that they are building up some kind of a force because there's more coming in, more coming in, well, where are they going? They just keep coming in. Well, it looks like they're building up some kind of an invasion force. They're getting ready to do something. And they want to make damn sure they got plenty of people to back them up. And so he said, it would appear to me, it appears to the people at NASA, that there is a black invasionary force of extraterrestrials who are getting ready to make their appearance known on the earth and they're getting ready, they're coming here. I just thought that was interesting because he was legitimately a, a very, very intelligent physicist and scientist who worked at and NASA. Could that be could that be why the president Donald Trump and the vice president what's his name again? I forgot his name. Uh, Pence Pence, Pence, Mike Pence. Oh my God, my brain just blanked there for me a second. Too. Me Pence. too. Yeah, right? I was like, is someone, anyway, so could that be why they just released their, because we know on this planet there are two factions that run this, two factions that run this planet, the Nazi faction and the Zionist faction. They both hate black people, right? They hate humanity, but they hate black people the most. So I find it ironic that both, both of them are very skilled in, because of extraterrestrial help, are very skilled in rocketry and space and these types and weaponry and these types of things. I find it ironic that we're seeing a buildup on Saturn by very advanced, and some would say the most advanced extraterrestrials in our solar system, and they're building up a fleet preparing for a battle and then Donald Trump and Mike Pence launches a space force. Are they preparing for something? And tailor your answers carefully because mm -hmm. this is Babylon's technology. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're on to something. I think there's definitely something there like you're seeing. I see the same thing you're talking about. And I think there probably is something going on that we are not being told about the buildup on the planet Saturn and that the, the on Saturn's North Pole is a star of David, a six-pointed hexagram, which the Jews call the Star of David. No, it's a six-pointed star, and it's on the North Pole of the planet Saturn. And we know that Saturn is the god of the Jews today. The Jews worship Saturn today. His name is El. Saturn was called El. So this is why you have Angel. The Angel is a, is a messenger of El, a messenger of God. But the Jews say that they're God's chosen people. And they wear a six-pointed star, which is called, if you look in the dictionary, the star, a six-pointed star, is called a hexagram, a hexagram. So therefore, the Jews are proud to show you we are wearing a hex. We have the hex put on us, the hexagram. So then they, they always complain about they are the most mistreated, most misunderstood people in the world. But you're wearing a hex on your, cho on your, on your, on your chest. You're wearing a hexagram. And so that's why... There is a hex on the North Pole of Saturn. I'm thinking there's something going on with the planet Saturn, the black extraterrestrials who are on Saturn, and they're building up, whoever these black extraterrestrials are, they're building up some kind of a force. They keep coming, but they're not leaving. 
they come and they come and he said and then the scientists told me we see them we see them coming in and going into the planet but we don't see them coming out so it looks like they're building up some kind of a force and normally in military terms when you see a military country building up and put more and more troops in a particular area they get ready to do something in that area and so they're building up troops so i think that there are the black extraterrestrials according to what he was talking about and they are building up some kind of an invasion force some kind of a force is coming on the earth and Hollywood's been telling us about this with television shows like V, the visitors who are coming to help us. They're going to help you all right. <laughs> they're coming and they're not going to be helping you. They're helping their well, their own. Well, we'll say this. At least they're not the reptiles because we're over reptilian rule on this planet. They're too evil. Okay, so maybe we need a changing of the guards to be ruled by the black extraterrestrials because nothing could be worse than being run by these lizards. What do you think? Uh, I hadn't thought about it, but it is an interesting point, and you may be onto something. Yeah, there very well George, is some something some going on. You want to get some water? No? No, no I haven't. Okay, good, 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 good. Because you've been talking uh, an hour and 35 minutes. So, guys, what do you think? You, you think you want to stop? You want to go on for a little bit more? I what think we think? ought to stop. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think now that we have finally figured out how to do the show from my end, I think mm -hmm. we could do, let's do the show again. We'll do it another yeah. time. Yeah. Sure, sure, definitely. So, listen, before you go... Do you have a PayPal? So if anyone wants to donate to you, they can donate to your PayPal. What's your PayPal? You go on my website to Jordan, like the Jordan River, jordanmaxwellshow.com. And when you go on jordanmaxwellshow.com, on the right-hand side of the screen, you will see a, a, a PayPal donate button. It says donate to Jordan Maxwell's work. Click on that and make your donation. Also, on Jordan Maxwell show, you will see on the front page of the website, you will see an advertisement for Jordan Maxwell Research Society. That's a different website. It's my own personal research website in which I am putting all the documents and pictures and videos and audios and lectures and research papers and all the hidden stuff of the world. I am having my web band put up and down and upload onto my research website all kinds of interesting research you've never heard of before. So go on my website to Jordan Maxwell Show and you will see on the right hand side of the page a donation to make a donation. Or you can join my research society in which I am now placing all the pictures and documents and videos and audios on all of my research is all there. I've been told that that's the thing to do. If you're going to put this kind of research that I do, if you're going to put it out there in the public, I was told by my lawyer friends that you should put it into a private and have people pay for it. And it's just a one-time donation for a lifetime subscription. But the point being is that when you join my research society, then that means you are a private organization and government has nothing to do with anything private. You can go into a restaurant, like I said last time, you could go into a restaurant with 10 of your friends and you can sit in the back of the restaurant and you can say anything you want to about anybody. Call them any name you want, no matter how racist and how filthy the name is, it doesn't matter. It's a private conversation. And as long as everybody around the table doesn't mind you using that kind of language, it's a private conversation. Government's got nothing to say about that. That's just between you and your friends. But if you go on the radio or go out on the street and talk like that, that's different. Because now you're involving the public. And government governments are empowered to protect the public from that kind of speech so now you're talking in public that's different you can get in trouble for that 
But if you're talking in private, you can say anything you want. As long as everybody around the table doesn't mind, why should I care? It's your private group, not mine. And so that's why I put all of my most important stuff that I'm working on that nobody knows about. It's on my private research society. So go on Jordan Maxwell's show and you will see a button on the right hand side to make a donation. Or if you want to join my research society, it's just a one time donation. It's got everything on there and it's going to have a lot more. My webman can only do so much in an eight hour day. He's only one man. But he's continually putting all of my research from over the years on my website. You'd be shocked and surprised at some of the stuff that's on there. Some of the documents you will not believe when you see them. So. Excellent, Jordan. Thank you so much. I just have one last question. Mm -hmm. Someone said, and I've heard this before, Jordan. Don't take this personally. Someone said that you were sued back in the 90s. They yeah. claimed that you were sued and that you were fraud and something like this. Yeah. Now, what was this about? Tell us. It's the it's called the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission. Yes, I was working with a friend of mine who was paying my rent for me and giving me money to live on. I have nothing and I own nothing, but I had an Armenian friend named Vic Barjabadian. And Vic owned a company where he was publishing a book called Cracking the Code, explaining how the Federal Reserve Bank worked and how the Federal Reserve and the banking worked, called Cracking the Code. It became very famous. Well, he was my friend who was giving me to live on. He was giving me a certain amount of money every month to live on. And then he began, because I'm doing radio, I talk about Vic's company. A lot of people are buying his book. Well, then it was decided, Vic and I decided I would do a radio show in Los Angeles. And so I was doing a, a major radio show in Los Angeles on Saturday night for Vic Varjabadian. And it's called BBCOA, Better Books and Bibles, a Better Books and Cassette Company. And I was talking about Vic's company and to go to his company and buy the books about the Federal Reserve and all that. Well, the company had other employees. I was a spokesman for it on radio, and he was paying for my radio show. But the company had other people in the office, and they started making deals with other companies to promote them, other companies that were doing similar kind of things that we were, so they were promoting them. And so the Federal Trade Commission came in, and some of the companies that Vic Varjabadian's company was doing business with were shut down for being frauds. Well, when they shut the companies down back east for being frauds, they're naturally going to shut down Vic because he's promoting them. And he didn't even know he was promoting them. It was so, such an incredible arrangement. The people in the office had made the arrangements. Well, when the federal government came down and shut down Vic Varjabadian because it looked like he was in business with people back east who were frauds, they shut him down. The police came in and shut him down. Well, he had been financing my radio shows, and I had been, he had been my sponsor, so I'm talking about his, his company. So it was decided that I'm also a, a member of, of, this, of this criminal syndicate. I'm just doing my thing, and he's promoting me already on paying for it. But when the federal government came in, they, they clamped down on him. And then they came after me because I'm out there promoting his book and promoting his company. I didn't know what he was doing. I didn't know he was getting in trouble. I didn't know he was doing all this other stuff. And so the Federal Trade Commission came in and found me guilty. They found me guilty of, and they told me the federal attorney came from came from Washington DC and called me and I had to go downtown Los Angeles to the federal building and be interviewed by the federal government and he told me he said we know that you didn't have anything to do with what's going on with Vic Barjabini we know that you're doing your thing on the radio and we know who you are and you didn't have nothing to do with any of this it's unfortunate though because the Federal Trade Commission figures if they put some heat on you, you will talk and tell us some things we want to know. 
So that's why we we that's why we brought you into it because you might know stuff what we want to know about Vic Barjabadia, and so they they were putting the pressure on me. Well, Vic decided he had because he was born and raised in the Middle East. He was Armenian, and so he decided to get the, out of the country. He was he was finished. So he caught a plane and went to uh, went to the UAE and went to work for an oil corporation down there, making plenty of money. And he's gone, and so they find him. They found him guilty of something, and they put a fine on him, a five hundred thousand dollar fine. It's just a fine. It's not criminal. It wasn't a criminal because he'd be in jail if it was a criminal. It wasn't a criminal event. It's just business. He was promoting somebody who was doing something wrong. So they fined him and told him he can't promote them anymore. We don't want you promoting yourself anymore. You just shut up and don't have nothing to do with none of this. And you owe us $500,000. Well, when he left town, he got on a plane and left town for good. That leaves me here like a fool by myself, and I'm the one that's on the paperwork too. So now they're going to come out to me. I don't have a, I don't have enough money to buy lunch, much less five hundred thousand dollars. And so they put the pressure on me, hoping I could tell them something about Vic that would help them to get him. I didn't know anything about him. I'm not, I'm not I'm part of his business. I didn't know he got in trouble. I don't even know what he got in trouble about because I don't know what he's doing. But I got in trouble, and so therefore, the people who cannot stand me, the Christian, born-again Christians, and people who do not like what I do, and that is blowing the whistle and talking to black folk about what's going on in the white folks' world, they don't want me talking at all. They want me to shut up. And so the best thing to do is put it out there on the web. Jordan Maxwell is a criminal. Don't have nothing to do with him because he's being sued by the government. And obviously he must be a wanton criminal. No, I'm just a poor, hapless white folks talking about all the bullshit that's going on in government. And government don't like me talking, period. And there's a lot of people in this country that don't like me talking about what I do. And so I've been charged with being a criminal. I've been called a Satan worshiper. I've been called all kinds of names. And people are charging me with all kinds of crimes. And I, my feeling is, like the federal attorney told me, we know you didn't have anything to do with it because when we came in, we shut down your bank account. And you only have $52 in the bank account. Vic Varjabadian had over $2 million. He made a lot of money off of you because a lot of people listened to you and you were promoting his book. A lot of people are buying it. So he made $2 million off of you, but you only have $52 in your bank account. So we know you didn't have a damn thing to do with none of it. He was just using you to make money off of you. And so I got, but I got sucked into the, the governmental arrest thing. And I got sucked into it because I'm the only one left. They didn't have him. He's gone to Asia. He's gone to the Middle East. So I was the only one left, so the government came in on me. Well, like I said, the born-again Christians and all the airheads and goofballs who are scared to death of me, they are scared to death of Jordan Maxwell because he damn well knows too much and he talks too much and the world is listening to him. So you need to make sure you destroy his work, his name, his reputation. Make sure nobody listens to him because he's dangerous. And you better do something about him while you can. So they start spreading the rumor. Jordan Maxwell is a criminal and he's a fraud and this and that. And he's a child hater and he, he's a racist and all kinds of bullshit. When all it amounts to is that somebody is trying to destroy my name and my work and my reputation, and I am still out here at 80 years old doing what I'm doing, trying to help my fellow man in this world to understand how the world works. So that's the way, and that's how it worked. That's how it happened. I got sucked into this because the man who was financing my radio show for me and paying my rent so I would have a place to live he was making a lot of money off of me. I didn't know. He was making millions off of me because I'm on radio talking about his book, and, and I was doing a good job of it. 
Lots of people were buying his book, and he was making a lot of money. But when the when the Federal Trade Commission caught up with him, he flipped out. He's gone. He went. You know, he went back to the Middle East and left me holding the bag. And so today I'm broke. I own nothing. I have nothing. I don't ask for anything. It's just a well. I can get nothing. Why? Because I because the people and around the world seized upon. They heard about Jordan Maxwell being. <clears throat> a criminal with the government, the federal government is coming after him because he's a criminal, he's a known criminal, he's a, a devil worshiper, he's talking about the demons and devils and all that kind of stuff and all this racist crap of his. And so we need to get rid of him, we've heard enough of him, so move it around, pass it around the world and tell everybody about how he's a big criminal. And so for being a big criminal, I would think if I was that big a criminal, at least I could pay my rent and have a, an apartment to live in if I was a criminal. I'm not working for the government. I'm not a criminal. I'm an old man who lives on Social Security and has and, has and owns nothing. I just do what I've done for 60 years. So that's the name of that too. I'm not a criminal. I never have been. I don't even know what it's all about. All I know is I got a lot of people in this country that don't want me talking. They want me to be totally out, out of the picture. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's the name of that. Tour. All right, Jordan. All right, Jordan. Thank you so much. It's been a great show. Two hours, guys. Please go to jordanmaxwellshow.com. Sign up for his research society. Many people have bought your books. Many people signed up. And if you want to support Jordan in any way, please support him on his PayPal, okay? And Jordan agreed to come back on the show. Jordan, you're welcome here anytime. It's been great talking to you, okay? Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much, man. and have a wonderful Friday. You too. Bye, Jordan. What a delight. You are a sweetheart. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye bye. Oh, screw you. Bye, Jordan. Thanks. Bye. All right. Okay, guys, that was an show. Guys, you see what I told you about those Christians? When they don't like what you have to say, they come out in full force like an army to destroy your reputation. Love goes out the window and war comes in. So you heard it from the horse's mouth. This is what he said that happened, and people take it, they twist it, and they say whatever. Guys, here's my take knowledge, get knowledge, use knowledge. Join up his research society. Go there, get the research. Don't walk around this planet like a fool, okay? Know what you know. Guys, tonight was awesome. Jordan is a great guest, and hopefully we'll have him back, okay? And he really enjoyed the show. Okay, guys, see you later. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening.